the, the right premiered in Boston, I guess in the 30s or 40s maybe, under Pierre Monteux, and the Globe critic, famous Globe critic, um, drew a picture of Stravinsky hanging from a gibbet with a rope around his neck. Uh, just, it was clearly him with a little fedora that he had and his mustache and the pince-nez glasses that he wore, and he's there swinging from this rope by his neck. Uh, the, the, the caption was, if he by right should write that right, then I by right should see him swing. <laughs> That's in the Globe. <laughs> okay, you'll find that somewhere. So, you know, Hugh, of course, um, with Hugh Wolf, with his magnificent sense of timing, has come up with a great idea. The Rite of Spring is 100 years old this coming May. Now, school gets out before then, so Hugh put it on his last orchestra program to, uh, to ceremonialize that event and its importance. And it still has the ability to shock. It's still fantastically exhilarating. Our kids are probably going to play the bejeebers out of it, because young people can. And young people took, caught on to this much quicker than the old masters sometimes did. You need to know that it has a high level of dissonance throughout. And Stravinsky um, said, we need that. That's what this is about. This is very tense. This is conflict between life and death between one group of human beings and another, a victim who's been chosen and those who are going to perpetrate the deed. And uh, he said, it's just what I heard. He, he once said, I don't know that I had any system or any theory, any plan, other than I was seized by this image of what this sacrifice was like, and I wanted to write a piece about it. And I wrote very fast, with no, no uh, difficulty at all. Uh, I just ate, slept, drank, and composed hours and hours every day, and especially uh, his best time was morning until about one or two when he got hungry. Um, and so he said, I, he didn't even do a whole lot of sketching for the ride, as I understand. There are, there are some fascinating sketch pages. This one, of course, appears, as I remember, in very black ink fairly early. Um, but he said, um, it came to me as if in a trance. You could say, this is a direct quote, I am the vessel through which Le Sacre passed into being. I simply wrote what, what some kind of power was telling me to do. Uh, it was like being in a trance. Then he told Robert Kraft, take that out. I can't have that in any book. So Kraft did take it out, and then long, a little while after Stravinsky passed, he put it back in. That's a famous quote, and Stravinsky didn't want to be given to making anything so um, so much that would be fodder for critics or that would make people think he was less of an artist. Um, but it's a good quote, and, and uh, he is indeed that person. Um, so what Hugh is going to deal with is not what the man who conducted the world premiere, which was Pierre Monteux, had to deal with. He had to deal with everybody hearing this for the first time. He had to develop beat patterns that would enable him to keep the orchestra together. He had to teach them, uh, I'm just guessing on this, but you know, when you have a lot of tritones and a lot of major sevenths and a lot of half steps, you know, you've got to tune those, believe it or not. They're, they're distances and they only sound right if the notes are, are so perfectly tuned that they really clash. I always get my students to do that. I say, be sure that the half steps are not small. They will start to blend. Get them to the right size and when they hurt the most, that's where the tuning should be. So uh, Monteux dealt with all of that. And uh, the end of the Rite of Spring is a grand sacrificial dance. It's really the big climax of what is a 35-minute piece, by the way, and it, that runs on a while, too. But that changes meter between 2 sixteenths and 3 sixteenths over and over and over again, so much that you cannot get a steady beat going, nor does he want you to. It's kind of staggering and drunk. It's like wrestlers or something. You know, you, there's no way to go right through it. Bernstein, among other composers, tried to put a more regular beat in it which doesn't work very well. Even Stravinsky rewrote the thing in 1945, the entire last movement, changing all the 16ths to 8ths, and also um, putting all, about 80% of the bar lines in different places than where they were in the original. But that doesn't work either. And um, it, what works is probably the notation that he used. And we see composers' scores. Um, the score I got to look at once was Pierre Boulez's score of this. He showed me. And um, he put down all of the groups of three tones with a triangle over them like this. But then if there were just two tones, he'd put a bracket. And he called these um, housetops and elephants. 
And he said, once I see those, I know exactly whether my beat should be quick or, sh or long. So you can go da 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 And you can go through the whole piece like that, almost as if once you learn it, you're on autopilot. You're not reading the score. You're feeling what you've already taught yourself. So Hugh's score is, of course, marked that way. He was a fantastic conductor, and he's, uh, you know, solid in every dimension. But one of the things that he's really solid in is is uh, understanding how his beat affects the music, and and uh, he's a, you know, some people call him a great technician. I think any great artist has to be a great technician, and he was an awful lot more than that. Um, so we're we're in for a real treat. One of the world's important conductors with one of the world's important conservatories orchestra with most of our most gifted students who are hungry and dying to do this.